Um, Matt, I can move around if I need to. Okay, great. Just, I found, there's like a chasm. <laughs> I want to be next to y'all. All right. Um, in addition, because uh, 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 I know there's a diversity of roles within inside this space. So, like, just to let you know, I can, uh, I'm not from here. I'm from California, born and raised in California, so it may explain a bit. Um, but I love South Yorkshire. I love Sheffield. So there I am. So that's my home with kids and stuff. Um, and one of the things I did when I became was a student at, uh, at Sheffield is I worked at Sheffield Hallam University where I started out my career in disabled student support. So I'm going to give you a bit of just a little snippet of I worked in various, I'm like the Swiss army knife of H U K H E because I worked in disabled student support, widening participation, academic development, uh, sat across learning technology folks, uh, worked in the academic department, worked in education, led three courses, revalidation, reapproval of courses. So uh, I've, I've done the whole gamut of HE, I hope, in terms of professional services and, and academic roles. So I needed you to, to, to hear that. So when I talk about widening access and widening participation, traditionally I've always been about attracting and getting students and doing the outreach work. And I know for a university such as my former employer, Sheffield Hallam, and universities such as Staffordshire, widening, widening participation means much more than just the outreach work. It means what we do inside the, the walls that we do. It also means what we do to develop those uh, undergraduates and students that come through and what do we equip them with, yeah? So I'm trying to just let you know where I'm at and, uh, and um, so, I've titled, oh, is the clicker working? It's not working. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'll just, and it's not working here. I'm really sorry. I thought I killed everything. Yes, yeah, uh, I did something wrong. I'm sorry I broke it. Matt, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay, cool. All right. So I'm going to start off. So like when I, um, one of these things, um, I'm going to introduce you guys to some theories, but this is just Victor Ray. He's an academic in the States. And, and I will concentrate on, I'm coming through this presentation when I talk, I know decolonization, there's like this focus on race. What I'm trying to do is I am looking at HE through a race lens, but I'm also accounting for intersectional, accounting for the structural forces that are upon us, like patriarchy, um, uh, social class. So when I, talk, when I talk through, I am focusing on race, but it doesn't necessarily just please be open-minded in terms of the structural forces that are at play that kind of controls, structures our lives, all right? I know that we've got agency within it, but just bear with me. So I'm starting off with Victor Ray. So Victor Ray, there's this, he, uh, in 2019, he written an article in the American Sociological Review, but he made him, he created uh, an accessible kind of, uh, uh, not an academic journal, but he written something for the Harvest, Harvard Business Review, and, and basically arguing um, that organizations, doesn't necessarily have to be a university, are not race-neutral race institutions, we're not, and what he was trying to do, which is, if, for some of y'all may know a bit about organizational theory. Maybe some folks inside the room may have experienced Storming and you know, Tuckman and all those lot. He was saying that a lot of those theories, there was like this taken for grantedness of race wasn't even part of that literature, part of that body of knowledge. So what he wanted to do was address a gap between organization theory and race studies. And so he was thinking about like organizations in general. So not just universities, but businesses, there's, they're not race neutral institutions. Organizations are not race neutral. So when, so when I'm thinking about that, I know that organizations are, are, are as well as, they're gendered, they're class, particularly in universities, yeah? So it's just making me think about why things that we have to contend with, particularly in terms of, um, <laughs> of the problematic issues that come around when we talk about like access and retention and graduate level outcomes and what have you, the data bit, and there's always these gaps, particularly when it comes to race. 
and social class. When I talk, and, I'll, and I'll talk more a bit about social class as well. But one of the things that kind of drives me knowing that there's this, the crapness of organizations that are hierarchical like a university, I kind of, uh, I follow another kind of thinking, which I love from decol decolonizing folks. Um, and you may have come across this open access article if you guys follow, if you guys do this stuff. It's uh, uh, from um, Eve Tuck and, um, and uh, Yang, yeah, Tuck and Yang article called De Decolonization is not a metaphor. Have you guys ever come across that? If you, don't worry, you should do, it's quite, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. But anyways, um, Yang, Wayne Yang, who he writes in a pseudonym, he's actually a, a, like a, a, a heavy duty manager in the UC University of California system. Um, dean of Students for University of San Diego. He talked about what a decolonizing university could possibly be, has to only share that love for black life or indigenous worlding. So he's talking about North America, um, i.e. colonized worlds for their futures. So just got to show that love. And I like that because some of y'all must have read Bell Hooks and Teaching to Transgress and talks about that love ethic. And the reason why I bring picture of R2D2 is that he illustrates that if you think about the university as a something that reproduces inequality that in a way it could be like a death star and if you have watched Star Wars what R2D2 does is he's a, a ro this little robot he always tinkers with stuff to make it work for the rebel cause yeah so he so La Popperson, Wayne Yang would argue that we all, you know, if we want to have a decolonizing university, um, we should all be cyborgs like R2D2. All right, all right. So that and that, that gives me hope because there's a lot of pessimism, particularly in university across the country, um, just working within them, yeah, and what we do, and what gives us hope because we can get caught in the pessimism and the cynicism of working in this industry but we have to cling on to a sense, a sense of hope, all right? So I am gonna be talking about hope and love and stuff, all right? I know it's not church, but I'm gonna bring church into this space, all right? Okay, right, so let me just talk about the destruction of <laughs> higher education. You guys are familiar with the achievement gap bit? Um, and can I just give, I wanna give massive props and respect to University of Staffordshire because you, this university was one of the first universities to sign up for the race equality charter. Yeah, it was one of the first, you know, it, even I've come across your access and recent access and participation plan that's on the web and the things that you guys are doing I, uh, and the, the words that you guys are using is so positive. And for me, it's a hope my university could do what you guys are saying on that piece of paper, yeah? So I just wanna give you props and respect, all right? Cause um, there's no reason for me to be, and I'm quite critical of universities, but there's no reason for me for this space. So the achievement gap, which you guys are addressing as well within your institution, you guys know, white and black, big gap, and it all starts off from school. So this is, is this is a, this graph came from a Jacqueline Stevenson, colleague at University of Leeds now. She did it for Office for Students, a report, and just was just showing, you can see like what happens in A-level, and then what happens when they come to university and the gap actually widens, yeah? There's something going on in the sector where black students are not succeeding. So we know that it's, it's not really a nice place for, for black students. Um, and we know that there's data that we know that students, particularly um, the folks use the category BAME here, um, but the Daring Report. So uh, the Daring Report, you can say what you want to say about it, I mean, it's probably the rationale why we have university fees now. But in that report, it did talk about ethnic minorities as a whole are more than proportionally represented in the sector, all right, compared to the general population. So the general population, that's what he written down, but we were talking about the white population, so he's comparing it, yeah. So he, was, he said this in 1997, and this has been confirmed a lot that black and brown students, students of color, are actually well represented. But the thing is, um, it was confirmed that <laughs> they have higher participation rates. However, their presence is much more heavily 
in places such as Sheffield Hallam, where I used to work, South for sure, post-92 universities, all right? They are not entering or they're less likely to be admitted to highly rejective institutions. I want you guys, when you guys leave here, repeat the phrase highly rejective, not highly selective. They just reject more, all right? They reject more black and brown students, all right? And they reject more students from Quintel uh, 1 and 2. All right. So we know, we know black and brown students are going into higher education at a higher rate than white students. However, they're most likely to be in post-92. Um, Jacqueline Stevenson, again, in a report, and this is what I love about your access and participation plan, because you both, you said this, not your access, yeah, your access participation plan, but also your race equality charter bit where you guys are actually using positive action for students as well as staff members in terms of recruitment, which I find encouraging. But Jacqueline Stevenson and this report was written in, uh, along with Advance HE as well as the Renamee Trust. So when I say Jacqueline Stevenson at all, it's not just Jacqueline Stevenson, it's in partnership with Renamee and Advance HE. We're arguing that we need to be when we think about this inequality that exists within our institutions and in the universities, that we need to think about positive action. And you guys have written that in your statements. I don't know if you guys are aware, but you guys have written that. I did check the receipts last night before I arrived, all right? And if, so positive action, that's, that's, that's a cool thing because not necessarily the whole folks within the country probably will like it, but it's one of those things that is there. It's in the equality duty legislation. And Jacqueline, Rennie Mead, and Advanced HE says we should use that in order to make higher education less, the sector less institutionally racist. Right. Now, um, we don't talk about Bruno. I got kids. Goodness me. That soundtrack just plays on. Do you guys like that tune? Do you guys want to sing it? Should we just sing along? No. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, when I, we don't talk about Bruno made me think about, the song makes me think about, we don't talk about race a lot in higher education. I'll show you the evidence from the research I'm about to present to you. And, and particularly, when I, and, and Dave Gilborn, who just retired from University of Birmingham, who's probably the most preeminent critical race theorist, not just in the UK, but like in the States, he constantly, they constantly invite him in the States, yeah? Uh, because of his scholarship on critical race theory, and he talks about the UK context specifically. He talks about a tacit intentionality of white supremacy, not just in universities, but throughout education in the country. Um, and, and he's not talking about white supremacy as Ku Klux Klans and Tiki Torches and, and, and Proud Boys. He's not talking about that. He's just talking about things that are embedded within the organization. So a flip back to Victor Ray's just new, they're, not, they're not neutral organizations. Higher education universities are not, are not neutral, all right? They're not gender neutral. They're not uh, race neutral. They're not social class neutral. They're, it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a contested space. Um, I just want to, and, and in the discourse, particularly in terms of researching and even in the meetings that we have in quality diversity committees, working out the access to participation plans, there's like a lack of, we talk about race and, particular spaces, but we don't talk about it throughout. And so there's what uh, uh, Subini on, on Amana from Stanford would, would argue is we, we evade color. We, we're color evasive, yeah, in, ed, in education. And, and, and I want to just touch on this really quickly because when I was doing this research, so it's basically a research on widening access, but I think is relevant to all the folks inside this room. Um, as I was doing this research, research um, and I know it's not a, a new thing, but when I was doing the research, there was a lot of things about um, the plight of the white, can, the white working class boy uh, in, this, in a lot of documents and government policy, particularly with Boris Johnson's brother, Joe Johnson, when he became, I forgot what that, what, what, what that white paper was, 2016-17, where we, I think, uh, uh, I forgot what it was called. Anyways, he went on about, Joe Johnson went on about the plight of the white working class in this paper and it turned into policy. However, prior to that, since 2008, uh, starting with labor, we started talking about white working class and, the, and, and their lack of performance in GCSEs, yeah, in schools. But that discourse 
with the with Joe Johnson in 2017, uh, I think it was called the Future of Higher Education or Teaching Excellence. Oh, I forgot the name of the uh, the document, but he brought it into he brought what we were talking that discourse on white working class boys from GCSEs. He brought that into higher education. So that's what Joe Johnson did. And what I'm what I'm highlighting to you guys is that the likes of Dave Gable, Dave Gilborn, um, Claire Crawford, and Sean DeMack. So Sean DeMack written for BERA, British Education Research Association, Claire Crawford and Dave Gilbert, they all challenge why are we focusing on the white working class bit. For them, these, these three individuals, these three academics, they were saying, they're offering a counter narrative saying actually the way that they're using statistics and this whole pull to the white working class is taking away the, the, the inequalities taking attention away from the race, actual race inequalities that is existing in the country. And I know, and like working class, we know, we know, I mean, I'm not discounting the fact that there are folks who are white or suffering and, and on free school meals. I'm not taking, not, I'm not, I'm not dismissing that at all, at all here. All right. I'm not dismissing that at all. Um, however, the discourse, the public discourse has shifted policy and that's what, and Dave Gilborn and Claire Crawford and Sean DeMack are saying, we can't, don't shift that away because what you're doing is you're just creating the race inequality and the discourse to promote it. So uh, even to the point where we have the House of Commons Education Committee on white working class um, and, the, and, the, and the Tory government reproducing it. Okay, uh, did I do something wrong here? I'm, I think I stuff it or I don't know what I do wrong. Ah. Anyways, it was working, now it's not working, and I just killed it again. Sorry, sorry, tech IT person. Are you guys tracking? Hello? Yes. You guys with me? Yes. Thank you. Yay, am I, am, I, am I killing it or something? I don't know, all right, okay, so Claire Crawford. Um, I'm just, sorry, I'm bringing some numbers. Uh, uh, I hate numbers as well, but uh, Claire Crawford does this thing, um, in, in, in quantitative, she looks at the stats and, and tries to offer a counter narrative. And particularly her and Dave Gilburn are really passionate about querying the, the discourse around white working class boys. And she was saying a lot of educational policy is dictated by that top stat. And I think this may, no, it doesn't work. Oh yeah, it does. That top stat there, so essentially uh, so when we talk about working class and educational policy, we're talking about free school meals, all right? So free school meals is not necessarily an indicator of working class. Free school meals is an indicator of economic deprivation, all right? That, like, that's, that's not good, all right? And uh, what, we be, what we use in educational policies is free school meals bit. I know we're in a university, but I think this, is, that that, this discourse is reflected in a lot of the widening access stuff that we do. And so she argues that with the evidence that one, almost one out of 10 uh, white kids on free school meals, this is what dictates educational policy today. All right, that one out of 10, not the nine out of 10, the one out of 10 in terms of looking at, um, and also I guess what to add is that even though that statistic is there and one out of 10 and all these kids suffer from economic deprivation. If you look down that column, you can see that one out of three Pakistani kids are on free school meals. Almost 45% of Bangladeshi kids on free school meals. 35%, like, <laughs> there's a lot of kids on free school meals, but what gets the, what gets the media frenzy is the one out of the 11.5, yeah? And that's what dictates education policy today. And so when what gets lost in the media portrayals, when we talk about social class, particularly when it comes to education and free school meals, this gets lost. The 80% of all black, of black kids, that gets lost in the discourse of the white working class. And that's what Claire and Dave and Sean DeMack are they, they, they want to offer that, they want to offer this counter narrative because they don't believe it's fair. And so you have folks saying that even though they have the data showing that this is wrong, 
even Dave Gilborn going to the uh, Education Select Committee and saying, you guys are using free school meals, the data wrong, and using this whole notion of working class wrong, because not all working class folks who will categorize themselves as working class folks or on free school meals, he was saying, it's, it's not a mistake. It's not an innocent mistake. You're distorting educational priorities and it is damaging kids of all ethnicities because actually policymakers have not shown any seriousness even about raising the attainment of those on free school meals. Remember Marcus Rash Rashford? Yeah. Um, so we, we're not doing any, the government's not doing anything about those students on, on free school meals anyway. But they, they pump, they're constantly reproducing that discourse. Now, um, just bear with me for about seven more minutes and we can take questions. <laughs> I'm, I just want to get, I want to engage with y'all. All right. Uh, um, all right. So I'm going to talk. So that I, I'm giving you all that background because it made me want to explore winding participation or writing access and, and how, what we do in higher education, reflecting on about all those, all those theorists like Victor Ray and what Claire was saying and Dave Gilborn because of that paper that Joel Johnson uh, written in 2017 and, and, and a lot of what we do is focused on that. And so Dave Gilmore goes, if you want to think about English educational policy, even like higher education policy, there are three questions, three testing questions you should ask, you know, should be investigating. Yeah, so, what, so I did a systematic literature review of all, all those of my colleagues who do research on widening participation, widening access. And these are the three questions that kind of driven me to look at what, what are we doing? How are we framing this stuff? So what are the priorities for widening access? What, uh, what, and what, what, is it, what is it about race? Is, race in, is it race neutral policies? Who benefits and what are the outcomes? So those are the three questions uh, that was kind of stirring my imagination to do this project that I'm sharing with y'all. So what is being prioritized? So what I did is I did a systematic literature review, gutted throughout the whole library and everything I could get from and scanned it uh, ended up with like 20 articles out of 436 or what and I read through as I drilled and narrowed it down I found that there's a particular framing and the framing is is that students the literature is more focused on students aspirations and motivations versus anything about the institution themselves so universities such as us yeah the focus is on the 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 deficits of those students and their families rather than what we do. Out of the 20 uh, articles, only about six considered structural racism in how students are recruited, uh, particularly in accessing highly rejective institutions and medical schools. So mostly medical schools are associated with those highly rejective institutions, as you guys would probably know. Oxford, Cambridge. Who are the benefits? So who, who, who are the beneficiaries? So as I was Looked, looked at all the studies, those who are benefiting are white applicants since the rollout of widening access policy, and that was, the rollout was 2004. And then there was a study by Ivy and found that white college students in Leicester had the highest proportion of pre-92 universities, which will include a good proportion of highly rejective universities to choose from in comparisons to students of color. So, all, again, if you thought back about four or five slides ago, the, there's a, almost a quarter of the student population are, are students of color, but they're still not accessing these highly rejective institutions. Um, so black and brown students are not, are not benefiting from widening access policy, particularly the outreach stuff, the recruitment and all that and what we do. Uh, even even in medicine and dentistry schools, they, they're trying their best uh, and you know, making leverages in order to get more black and brown students into their places with, and they continue to find that pre-entry, our reliance on pre-entry qualifications, exam results, cognitive ability tests favor those who are traditional applicants to medicine that is white and high social class. The outcomes, um, and so there are a, a couple of articles and about medical school entrance, and I know that they're like most post 92s don't have that, but it's something to think about when we when we gauge what we do. Is that there are two initiatives? One initiative 
uh, was the graduate entry program. And the graduate entry program is basically you can go into medical school, medical school after you graduate, if, if you have a degree. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. So basically it's a mature student program to get more doctors into the NHS. And, and they thought it would be, they considered that a WP initiative. And what they witnessed, uh, the Mather study, was there was no significant change as the, there was more students getting in, in, into the program. So it didn't benefit students of color. They thought that would be an initiative that would do that, and it didn't. Another thing was the introduction of the UK uh, clinical aptitude test. Fielding did it, and they saw there was no significant changes. Uh, and, and, and the proportion of students accepting a place who were from lower socioeconomic economic groups and non-selective schools were non-white or and or male. So there was no significant change with that initiative as well. So the things that we do to recruit more black and brown students into our universities is not, hasn't worked. So the outcomes, again, is not benefiting students of color at all. So uh, I call it the good news. The good news statistic of, gear, of daring was that there's more black and brown students, higher proportion of them coming to universities. That's cool. Uh, however, there's and there's concern, there's a, um, there's a concern. What the concern is that actually, although it's good news, they're not accessing those elite, when we talk about graduate level jobs or graduate level employment and going into those highly elite schools, black and brown students are not getting those opportunities, less likely. Mathers, who did that study on one of, on, on one of those initiatives, was saying that we need to think about uh, positive action stuff. Um, but, he, but they expressed concern about the right-wing media backlash. And, and, and as you guys, as in terms of the white working class narrative, the left behind discourse in education, um, that, is a, that is a big force to contend with, yeah? Particularly in publicly funded institutions such as this, where I'm not gonna say anything controversial, but Michelle Donnellan hasn't really done anything for our sector, right? Okay, I don't think that's controversial to say. Um, uh, Jacqueline Stevenson again laid out a rationale as well as Mathers about targeted interventions based on, on and which university has said on paper to, to what we're going to do. And then, although although there's reasons to be pessimistic and cynical, I always want to be that. I always want to be R2D2. All right, so I always have that picture in my head. So I want to cling on to hope. John Rayford, who used to who did his PhD here, I believe. Um, he did some interviews with practitioners. So I go, I want to interview practitioners too. And what I ended up doing, and everything under the guise of winding participation, I got folks that nece not necessarily work in winding participation teams within the university. I was able to interview 16, just like John did, but I got like professors who wanted to be a part of the study. I got people who do the actual recruitment. I got people from marketing. Um, it was like a vast spread of people who feel like they, they do widening participation work, all right? And so I go, I'm gonna, give me your thoughts about what's going on, particularly when it comes to race and widening access. All right, okay, I will shut up at some point. All right, so I'm gonna cling on, to, I'm cling on to hope. I'm just gonna, um, there are three themes I'm gonna highlight here, I'm gonna sh and I'm gonna read out some quotes, and then I'll, we'll take questions. So theme one was that the widening access folks I talked to, the majority of folks, there were 16 of them, 14 of them would, I would, I didn't ask for their race, but some volunteered, but the majority of them were white, right? 14 out of the 16 were white folks, and two were uh, self-identified as black. They all knew I was doing, re I wanted to get, talk about widening ad access and widening participation and race. And so one of the themes, looking through my interviews and the transcripts that I've got, one was just acknowledging, they all acknowledged structural racism, and they all talked about this white working class discourse. I didn't even ask questions about that, uh, the white working, they just brought, some of them just brought it up, because at the time, there was like these newspaper reports, the, Tom, uh, the Sewell report was out, so like, there, there was all stuff kicking off. So theme one, and, and so I found this, this is where I query about an organization being race neutral. So this is, was Jackie. Um, uh, she would just self-identify as middle class and white woman. I chaired an equality diversity committee, but just after 
the George Floyd bit. We had a meeting and we talked just generally about how everyone was feeling about that, what it meant to them and so on. And one of my colleagues, uh, who's a black female, she said her biggest frustra frustration from all of it is that people seem to be frightened to ask her how she was about it because she felt that people didn't want to ask her because she's black, but she's like, but I want people to ask me because it obviously hurts me and upsets me because I'm black. So she said it's weird, like everyone's frightened about talking to her about it when actually that's all she wants is people to talk about it. They want, she wanted someone to talk about Bruno, all right? But, no, but during that time, no one doesn't want to ask. And is it, be, is it because of this facade that we think that we work in meritocratic, race neutral organizations and we try and that's what we're reproducing, but in a way that's causing someone to be misrecognized and silencing one. Um, and this was in an equality diversity committee and the person felt silent about it. Um, again, challenging this race neutral organization bit. Um, um, Casey uh, works in, she was working in widening access as well. Um, and she just went off on one. And she was just saying, I've been saying, we we're talking about is right, you know, organizations, universities, and talking about, for some reason, we got into discussion about the white working class, and then she goes, I've been saying for years that I think the, the phrase white working class is essentially just this racist dog whistle because if what you mean is working class, if you think working cla class kids are disadvantaged, then you're, they're gonna be disadvantaged by virtue of the fact that they're working class, not because they're white. And at the time, widening access and widening policy was directed towards white working class kids. And some initiatives in the early days, in two, uh, early, 2016, about five years ago, there were targeted recruitment outreach programs that targeted white working class boys. And some folks had, and that was kind of problematic and that's what she was on about. Right, okay, but we, so there's, okay, yeah. So we know that there, we work in not race, race neutral organizations. So what do we do about it? So uh, again, Archie Dietrich gives me hope. All right, so I know all of them wanted to be interviewed, all of them wanted that to build an inclusive university and all of them hinged on their access and participation plans within their universities. Those documents are, are they're, they're, they're symbols of hope and hopefully we can recouple, not decouple some of the stuff, our practices according to it. Right, so cyborg in the making. So this is, oh, uh, this dude was cool. All right, um, well, hold on, let me make sure. Oh no, that's not dude, it's Liza, okay. Um, let me just remind myself what this was about. Okay, yeah, okay. This is where she's going, widening access is not about those folks about recruitment. This is about what we do inside these, in, in the practice that we do every day when we're working in university. It's not as much of an issue for us, I guess, in terms of kind of getting those traditional WP students through the door. So part of the thing that we're working on now is, as an institution is around, okay, how do we support them when they're here? But also when they leave the university. So we're starting to think about things like access to postgraduate courses because, okay, I just want to, in summary, Liza, what she's saying is access is not an issue for her university, just as it wasn't an issue, maybe, I know it's not an issue for Staffordshire because I look at your APP, um, but it's what we do with those students when they're inside the, in, inside the room with us, yeah? Okay. Oh, sorry, there's another crow. Again, same kind of thing. This one I like, this, this quote from Iona is cool because what she's saying is, again, access is not an issue. The university's focus on funding and priorities have not necessarily been on access because they get it. They, they, they're, they're winners in that. However, it's in terms of continuation, retention, and then achievement gaps, and those things are huge. They're really working their asses off. Did I say that right? On it. So we're kind of, in a way, had a lot of freedom to do the projects that benefit. So they said, we're going to use that resource to work with the local community, like across the street, rather than anything else, and co partner and co design projects with those who are in people referral units, like, like doing actual community work. And they got the sign off from SLT, senior leadership team, and folks to do that, right? Because access is not an issue. They just want to help get the get those in the community to be retained and, and, and make, ensure that they, they're equipped to do stuff inside the classroom with us. Okay, two more slides. You guys are doing really well, sorry. Um, 
lastly, pursuing the decolonial, decolonial desires. And I, I saw Stella, Stella, Stella Devitt Jones, and I know she was just in the room with us, but she, unfortunately she couldn't be here, but I know she does stuff with you guys here. Uh, but Stella, I, I mentioned Stella because she has one of those senior kind of like national teaching fellowships in, or senior higher education, you know, those kind of things that make you like renowned in teaching. So this quote from Marvin was sitting around a meeting. She's, he's describing a meeting and a conversation he had with those people at his university who got all those cool titles, national teaching fellows, because they are tapped upon for their expertise in order to create learning and teaching strategy throughout the university. You may have had one of those kind of Illuminati groups. Right, so he's saying, I was picking up on the fact in this meeting that we don't have many black and ethnically minoritized staff who apply for those teaching awards, like they haven't applied for senior fellowship of the Higher Education Academy or teaching fellow internally. And I made a point that it looks pretty white, don't it, lads? What are we going to do? And then this one guy went, this is a disgrace. I can believe you're anti-white racism. And then he goes, I'm more than happy to counsel racists or misogynists or people who are anti-trans. And so like the fact that he's doing it at a meeting, like he's pursuing, like he's actually saying something, like he's calling something out. I know it's like minuscule, like a micro, but it's him pursuing his de decolonial desires in an education system where this group actually feeds into the, the learning teaching strategy of, the, of his institution. Last quote, and this is an outreach worker who's visiting the school. And this is where I go, okay, she's being R2D2 here. So she was, there was a session, it was all girls, all girls of color, she says in that session, and they were just being so disrespectful to the outreach guy that was, that was presenting, and she goes, I just stopped the whole session and I just laid into them. She's a black woman, all right? She just laid into them. And she goes, some people may see that as un unprofessional, but at the end of the day, we're their role models and I have lived their experience to some degree, and I'm in higher education. And this is where I find this, well, I found really tricky, and this is where I'm going to end here. You, she goes, you just got to hold it down while you can. It's a crap situation, higher education. I don't know. Right now, it might not get any better, but all you got to do is hold it down. She's talking to the students, but I feel she's also talking to herself as well. What else are you going to say? And it's this double bind. And I'm, this is my concluding it's the last slide. As I said, there are reasons to be pessimistic. Uh, with racialized organizations, achievement gap, attainment gaps, retention, graduate le level outcomes, all that kind of stuff. But there are also reasons to be optimistic because uh, hopefully those quotes, those last two quotes, there are things that we can do. There's things that we can feed into at meetings, for instance. There's things that we can do in the classroom. There are reasons to be optimistic. There are reasons to be the R2D2. Let's be R2D2, all right, in our practice. And that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say, all right? I know it's hard, but let's do it, all right? Okay, that's my talk.